What is crack a lacking, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Valley coming at you with my certified fantabulous thermonuclear AF co host, Mr. Grant Hughes. We are taking a break from the trade deadline machine. We're going to rank our top 22 under 22 NBA prospects. So, just to clarify, we are ranking them the two things you need to note. Under 22, meaning that this has to be their age 21 season or younger, meaning if they turn 21, uh, excuse me, if they turn 22 after January 31st, they were not eligible for this exercise. If they are already age 22 or older, they were not eligible. We also ranked these players um, as if we're getting them. Yes, it was based a lot of what we've seen this season, but we're also looking at, well, who do we want for the rest of their career? And so we'll have discussions throughout. We have tiers set up. But we also have a specific order. Grant and I will, you know, haggle over anything that we might disagree with in retrospect after we did hash out this final pecking order. But it was fun. Figured we would share it with you after we went through this exercise. But the first question, Grant, how the heck are you doing? Dan, I love evergreen content. Just number one. So I'm just happy to be here doing this. We we're going to do this like the last three weeks in a row and <laughs> just kept kept punting it. And you know what? still works so i'm happy about it it's still there's nothing no regrets yet either i guess we'll see as we go through the order mm -hmm. here as one through 22 and so do you think there's a is there any debate over who is number one like, i think there there can't be like they're just you can't be serious at all about this and and really quibble of, over number one right it has to be Mr. women, women yeah, i'm already threw them up there for anyone watching on youtube you can see throwing We'll throw them up in our little tiers there. We'll order them within tiers for the most part, unless we think it's really too close to call. But yeah, please carry on. I you know I was just gonna say the only question is, does he belong in a tier by himself? And I don't. We didn't really discuss this ahead of time, and I can't honestly. I think I can't remember how when we did the write up initially if we sort of thought it thought about it that way. But like, what uh, should he just be alone, or should we? Are we gonna stick some other ones the up thing here? That with gives him? me pause is that he's been so much more efficient since he's been moved to basically the de facto five. Yeah. But some of that is about his, where the ball is being delivered. And so for him to be in a tier by himself, I think you have to believe that he just does so much defensively. That's what fuels it. Because I don't know that we've seen enough self creation, efficient self creation to say, Oh, he is one of one offensively from this group. Does that make sense? Yeah. I just, um, well, okay, we'll, maybe we can come back to that after we've got a couple tiers established and just kind of see how it feels. Because I think like... I think yeah, we could go a tier by himself. That's fine with me. I'm asking you if you think that he does enough offensively for that to be the case. I, I think like maybe not now, but if we're... And, and, if, and we are, if we're talking about this as like as a prospect or as like you get this guy for the duration, I just like, I just don't... I do think he's kind of one of one. So I think you're right. Like he's shooting under 30% from three. Like he's not, you know, run like creating tons of shots for himself. Although like one of the things that's happened since he's playing more center is like his passing has just been kind of unlocked because of like yep. you said, where he's getting the ball. So like again with him, and this will be the case for like what two or three more years, we're going to have to talk about him in terms of like surface scratching. We just like, we don't know yet. Like we're just, getting little glimpses of, of what he can be. My gut says he should be by himself in a tier. Um, Done. but I, I mean, like, you don't have to convince me. Remember what I said after everyone was up in arms about his bad, bad summer league game. game. And I said, <laughs> yeah. he's going to be one of the best players of all time. <laughs> let's leave him. Let's leave him in a tier by himself for now. And if we really feel like that's the wrong move, we can come back. Um, number two, I think, uh, doesn't really to me like have a, have much competition uh Ooh. maybe you disagree um so chet holmgren is our is our number two uh i guess and yeah in a, in a currently in a tier by himself but he will have some company i look i think defensively like i don't know if he's gonna be the like a go bear like defense unto himself type of guy necessarily like he might be but his mobility, his agility, his lateral quickness, like you can really feel good about him switched on to wings and guards and like mm -hmm. his ability to, you know, get beat or like or whatever and just like recover with length and like pin shots to the backboard 
or just come out of nowhere as a help rotator. Like that's one thing. I think he's been like an all defense level guy potentially right now as a rookie. And then offensively, like I, I really, I did watch him in college a little bit, but I don't think I appreciated like how much the guy we, I said this last week when we were talking like how much the guy just looks and moves like a guard at seven feet. Like his ball handling is really good for, which is so hard to be a good ball handler when your dribbles are like five feet off the ground. Like that's just difficult because of the physics of it. Um, as a, as a, as a driver, obviously he can shoot it. Like he's under 40% now, but like, I think he commands tons of defensive attention as a shooter, which is like all that really matters. And he, I think he's going to be a well above average three point shooter. I just, I think, I think he's just like, he might be an all-star. Uh, you were, I don't yeah. know. There's not too many other guys. We're going to say that about this year. And, and as, as a two way guy, like you could make his all-star case. I mean, all-star cases are always offensive, but like if they consider defense, you would probably put him in there too. And so I'll lead that into our number three discussion to talk about number two. And we have Paolo Bancaro at number three, who I don't think he has to be like the, like the only option to, but I don't think that like, we don't have anybody else that I, I there are probably a couple guys that could be in this. We'll probably still have them in this tier, but as of right now, especially when you're waiting, what we've seen this season, I think you could make a case for Paolo over Chet Paolo more than, and it just comes down to the comp, the complex nature of their offensive roles. Paolo more than half, way more than half his buckets go unassisted. Chet, yeah. you have about three quarters of his buckets are assisted. Now, what makes the difference for me with Chet is that Paolo Bancaro will be, I think, could be one of the league's two uh, premier two-way players. He's been better defensively through these past two seasons than I think a lot of people give him credit for. What I really think gives Chet a potential leg up, and this is so close. They're in the same tier, so we're splitting hairs with these two sp specifically. Um, Chet Holmgren has shown ball skills. It's been in open space, but like he's done some stuff in traffic and some spins and then like the quick ball moving. The ceiling on offense is higher where it's Paolo Carroll's defensive ceiling is higher than you give him credit for. Chet Holmgren has a higher offensive ceiling than this is just sort of a play finisher who's capitalizing on the talent around him. And that's huge. And with Paolo Carroll, there's always going to be the question about, well, not always, but can we see the efficiency tick up? The three-pointer looks good right now. He gets to the line. Can the in-between stuff finish and get even better? I think it can. These two are so close for me, but I do, what I will say is Chet feels like he could be a transcendent, transformative defensive piece. I don't know if I say the same about Paolo Bancaro on yeah. the offensive end, where he could be a superstar offensive player, but would you consider him, you know, the best offensive player in the league material, where I think Chet could one day be the best defensive player in the league, even with Wemby existing? Yeah. I mean, it's really different roles. I think for me, the thing I've always, I mean, I say always like he's been around forever, but I, I think Bancaro like does have, he is a, like does have the potential. He sort of is right now, but like, like you said, the efficiency is not quite there. He does get to the line a lot, which helps, but like 35.6% on threes, 45 and a half percent on t uh, overall, like, you know, he's 21. So like, the, the, and again, the the Magic don't give him much space in which right. to operate in the half really court. bad situation offensively for him. So he like the degree of difficulty for him is like leaps and bounds greater than it is for Chet, who like gets to play off SGA and Jalen Williams and you know gets to go against matchups that are like, oh shit, we have to put a big on him who's not right. quick and can't handle him on the perimeter. Bancaro just gets the other teams like whoever can guard the best for like you know, so Bancaro just has a harder job to do. But I was going to say, I think Bancaro has the upside of like, he's a number one option on a good offense someday. Like that's, I think that's the vision for him. I don't know if that's true of Chet. I also don't know if Chet needs to do that to like be the best version of himself. So pretty different players. But I think, I think I'm fine with them in the same tier. Um, I just, maybe I'm just more intrigued by Chet because he's just like, we've kind of seen a Bancaro type. Like he's a big Carmelo type or like Blake Griffin. -y. Like there's, there's been guys kind of like him, but but Chet is like, I don't know, he's like Dirk with a handle, like like that kind of thing. It, that's that's a harder uh, comp for me to get to. So we are on to number four. Uh, I don't We're know in the same tier, right? I I think this probably has to be the same tier. Uh, it's Alper and two, I'm looking at the next two players specifically, and I think they need to be in the same this this tier. Well, let's talk about number five in a minute, but let's put. Sh I think Shangun can go with Chet and and Paolo. I think I feel I feel fine about that because like 
he is the hub of an offense at a mm-hmm. position you don't normally get that from and is defensively like viable now, which was a big question earlier can in his I, career. Can I though one complaint? And I know yeah. it's because they're both Caucasian. The Nicole Jokic comparison is just like kind of need to stop. This dude is like, I and it, so did the Sabonis comparisons because they facilitate the offense in different ways. There's just you there's some similarities to both. Like Shangun is clearly his own player. And it's just the way he passes or sets up the offense, it's a lot more bully ball type stuff than it would than it's like Nikola Jokic's thermaturgy. Like where it's actual witchcraft. I know Shangun can throw those types of passes, but like <laughs> Nikola Jokic is witchcraft on the move from standstills, and it's just a yeah. lot more finesse to it, I think, than what Shangun does. Yeah, like the the big guy who can pass gets the Jokic comparison, kind of like how every really athletic shooting guard for like 20 years got the next Jordan, like Jerry Stackhouse is the next Michael Jordan or like, you know, there's all these, all these guys. It's like, okay. Cause he's like <laughs> sort of physically similar and moves around a little bit like him like that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the Jokic thing is insane, but uh, as, as like an offensive hub, I think Shangun is like, you know, he's not going to get to Jokic level, but like he might get, you know, to be number two. Like he might, I think he absolutely has the potential to be a better offensive hub than Sabonis. He might be one right now or pretty close to it. And he's much younger. Um, and I think, I think you, the three point shot is like, just not there for him still. Uh, but he's a decent free throw shooter and he's getting to the line more. I, I just like, I don't really have a lot of notes for Shangun. I think he's, he's, he's addressed the defense question like well enough to where you can, cause you might for a while there, you couldn't, you could say like, I'm not sure if you can really build a winner around him because of the defense. Like now the defense is like, okay enough. And the Rockets as a team are a lot of it is just like, he's able to be in his station because you have Fred Van Fleet and Dylan Brooks and Taris and, and Jay Sean Tate and now Amen Thompson, like the, just the competency level around him has improved, yeah. which is that's still fine to be able to just have your base station and be good at that. Yeah. All right. So this is the, the next guy we kind of have to decide what to do with. And that's, I think he belongs. Anderson. I don't think we could just, when you're looking at the sample size, we can't just say he needs to be in a lower tier when we considered him among like the most transformative prospects, like in uh, you, especially in recent, I did. that's Scoot Henderson at number yeah. five. So the, the question, if we're going to th- discuss moving him down, I'm not saying we will. It just needs to be like, do we need to, re- is it, do we need to reevaluate some of our priors about like his ceiling just based on what um, we've seen so far, just flat out too early. There's just, look, look at all the injuries and lack of big stuff in Portland at this point. Scoot himself was banged up for a lot of the year. The efficiency is going to come. Some of the decision-making has gotten better already from him. You can see it when he gets into the lane. It feels like he's changing the cadence of his dribble, dribble, excuse me, a little bit more. And also a big deal here. He's at 38.9% on off the dribble threes this year, about two attempts per game. That's not nothing as a no, rookie. Yeah. And so, yeah. Okay. You look and it's 22.1% on catch and shoots. That's not like a, okay, whatever he's, and he's shooting 30% on wide open threes. That's not great, but he's played in 30 games. And so I don't think we can change. Yeah. It's enough to say, well, the body of work from look, Wemmin Yama, uh, Holmgren, Bankero, and Shangun, those all have they all have all star cases right now. Yeah. And right. Scoot Henderson doesn't have that, but I don't know that what we've seen this season should change the trajectory of what we think at all. The fact that to me that he's behind Shangun is like that's the pullback that we decided he needed because you yeah. probably would have had him coming into this season before they'd taken the floor ahead of Chet. I would have. Yeah, I would have. I would have. I think that's right. Just as a, as a matter of principle, like you can't say a guy is the best point guard prospect since you name it in June. And then by the following January decide he's like a third tier under 22 guy. We just like, yeah. that's an overcorrection. I think he at least for now gets to stay here. And if anything, it's like a shock. He's him and Chet aren't like tier one probably. Uh, so I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Uh, who's number six on our list. Jabari Smith Jr., which I think starts a separate tier, correct? I would agree with that. Tier three. Which, like, I don't know what you call this tier, like, potential all-star someday, but just, like, is not that, is not very close to that right now, right? Like, I, you know, there's an inexact... This is definitely uh, a tier in which you would still, maybe not bet on, but envision 
scenarios in which they make one or more all-star appearances. I think the first two tiers are very much, these are probable, likely, or should be all NBA guys. We're yeah. kind of exiting that territory. Although, you know what Smith has on some of these guys, really actually all of them, I think, other than Wemby, he's still 20. Um, and this is his age 20 season. So like Chet's age 21, Paolo's age 21, Shangun, I think is age 21, although he's three years in. Um, I think like, so right now today, I feel confident saying Jabari Smith Jr. is going to be a really dangerous three-point shooter, 37.5% right now, um, and someone that can guard definitely threes and fours, maybe fives. And so like he's a luxury, he's like a high-end complimentary piece that that will should start for like most teams right now today at age 20. And so the question is like, how much expansion is there after that? And I think probably it's a lot, um, but I it's hard to put him in the higher tier, I guess, even conceding that. I think the path for him to get there, and it's tough with Shangun, would be, is this someone who develops into more of a five where he's even more of a mismatch nightmare offensively? We've seen a little yeah. bit more of those minutes in Houston this season, but the data on them also isn't like super effective at the moment. Uh, I still think like just the defensive scale, but the fact that he's so scalable at both ends of the floor yeah. is a biggie because when you talk about bigs, you very rarely talk about two way scalability. It's either one end or the other, but it's seldom when we're talking about scalability, it's normally guards or wings. And he's just this big who fits like a glove basically anywhere on both ends of the floor. Yeah, he's like an, I mean, his floor is just like, he's going to make, you know, he's going to get several hundred million dollars, like nine figure contracts as, as like a, he fits everywhere. So everyone wants him and, and, and like, he just will never not be useful on both ends, which is like at 20, like, I just can't get over that too. So, um, so number would, seven, we have Shaden Sharp of the Portland Trailblazers. See, we did these. We did our original rankings long enough ago that I can't remember. That one kind of surprised me a little bit. Um, is he? Yeah. You, so you got him in the Smith. I think he has to be in that tier. I think we can't move down tiers yet. No, the guy yeah. who's behind him. And I think maybe actually let's talk about him as well. So at, uh, this is what number eight. We have yeah. Brandon Miller of the Charlotte Hornets. And like the more I've thought about it, I've wondered. I've wondered if Brandon Miller needs to be number seven instead of eight. But I would say that Brandon Miller absolutely needs to be in this tier. Because you talk about two way scalability, he's already shown it, and he's taken on some real defensive assignments in Charlotte this season. The catch and shoot stroke is already there, moves well off the ball, good at running the floor. It's just the self creation aspect of his game. And I think he's shown flashes of being able to get to spots in the mid range. Can he hit those shots consistently? Can he facilitate for his teammates? Those are all questions that he's kind of answered in the negative a lot this year, but he's also a rookie. And so it's just like, how much do you want him to answer in? the affirmative. And so I could be talking about putting him ahead of Shaden. I, I mean, like, I, I guess I don't feel super strongly about moving him, you know, moving guys around in tears, although I wouldn't put either of them ahead of Jabari Smith. I, I think the case for Shaden is just that, like nuclear athleticism. Like that's just, and so, something Miller doesn't have that. That doesn't always mean a whole lot, but it, I think it, I think it, maybe the, the difference is like, Sharp has sharp ceiling might just be higher because of his like physical tools. Um, but like right now it's also kind of easy to see sharp being someone that is like a Jalen green type where we're kind of like, eh, I don't know. And Jalen Green's going to show up on this list, but it's not going to be that high. Um, whereas Miller is another guy that like, kind of like Smith, he's going to fit someplace as a starter for a really long time. And then the question is like, can he nudge up stuff on the margins to be more than that? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like Miller definitely has more of a, a guaranteed equilibrium where Sharp, does, I don't know if he's going to be able to exist in like that in-between space if he doesn't hit his highest end outcome. So, yeah, so like the the I think to your point, the argument for putting Miller ahead of Sharp is that like I can't really imagine Miller being someone five years from now. We go, hey, remember when we thought Miller was going to be really good and it turns out he's just going to be an empty stats guy? Yeah. And like that's more likely to happen with Sharp but he's still just such like a mystery box because of all the, so, just look at the way he scored this season too yeah. it's just, it's big. Uh, I'm still not ready to exit this tier with the next couple guys that we have come. I'm in love with number 10, but, uh, at number nine, uh, who do oh, we yeah. have it? Who do nine we, is the uh, Asar Thompson. Yeah. Asar Thompson at number nine. I still think he absolutely belongs in this tier. 
I think it's just like the stuff he can do defensively and already as a connective passer. The big thing with him is just like, is he ever going to do enough as a jump shooter? And or is he ever going to be a good enough passer to where you want the ball in his hand so much that it doesn't matter? And you look to surround him with maybe a big he can play pick and roll with and then three shooters. That does make him a little bit more limiting than some other players. But like to already be a plus passer as a rookie and then just to be able to do like some real iconic stuff on the defensive end already. And there was just like for so long this season, he was among the top five leaders in stocks. And like, of course there, yes, there was a, some pullback there. People got healthy in Detroit. Uh, His role has, I don't know. I don't want to use the word like been marginalized, but it's been marginalized. Like there's just games where it's like, he's not going to play nearly enough. And you're like, well, what the fuck Monty Williams? What are we doing? Say that a lot about what Monty Williams is doing. And so I feel like that's made it, he's almost gotten harder to evaluate as the season's gone on, which is weird to say. Um, yeah. Nothing to change the outlook on it. It's just, I will tell you, of the players so far in this tier, who's the one that you could see most likely jumping a tier if like the one thing you're worried about pans out? And it's if, if a Sar Thompson becomes a league average shooter oh. from deep, it's just like, oh, is he kind of right after Bancaro here? Like, what is <laughs> where does he go? Right. Well, that's that's the thing, is like he requires the most projection because the just a glare, like 13% from three and just like the mechanics are not good. Like if, if he like, he, he does not belong in this tier. If his three point shot continues to just be a total zero, like he might not be, you know, cause he's just not a helpful player right now on balance, even though he's like maybe one of the best all around defensive players in the league, like as a rookie. But yeah, I, I, I feel good enough about like, I don't know, like how well does he need to shoot to be able to play? Yeah. yeah. And by the way, just to frame it, he has not made a three in nearly a month as we yeah. record this on January uh, 18th. Yeah. It's, so. it's not good. It's a real problem in ways that like no one else we've covered so far has like nobody else we've touched on has a weakness. Although like scoot, I think probably still has a lower true shooting percentage just because he has been missing from everywhere. But Thompson has a huge weakness. I just, I just think like I'm with you defensively. The guy is like, from another planet uh this next guy at number 10 i am bullish on and uh, you could talk me into moving him up blau cool bali of washington i know a lot of people probably aren't watching the wizards and that's not oh hey me and grant watch basketball and you don't have blah, blah, blah. blau cool is just really good and that's without the wizards giving him real agency over the offense yet the three ball further along than advertised he is fucking shit up in transition against opposing defenses um he can get when you give him some space with the ball he can do some things with it in his hand. I'd like to see him run in some more slowed down situations, have to work through some traffic. They're not having him do that a ton right now. But I think maybe after the trade deadline, we'll see that happen more. I also think he's a player that could develop into. He's just disruptive on defense right now. And there are going to be mistakes, but you know what? They're throwing him on the opposition's best player, and he's not fouling a ton right now. So he might be getting torched, but he's also not fouling. And it's also the team is getting torched because it's the Wizards. This is someone who was billed as a project, and in some ways he is. Offensively, there's that, okay, well, what is the mold of him? But, man, this is someone could... No, I'm not going to give him, oh, he could be the best player on a contender, but, like, is did they just find one of the two most important players of their rebuild? Uh, they might have. He oh, is that oh, yeah. good. Yeah. He's also only 19. He won't turn 20 until July. So, like, I, I know Younger sometimes that's like, well, who fun. gives... Who gives a shit? It's just like, well, he's got more runway and like he already needed less runway than we thought. You know, he's more developed, had more polished skills than he was built to ha- have had. So, yeah, I, I can't move him up. But yeah, I I I am as high on him for slightly different reasons as I am on Thompson. So I think he very much belongs where we've got him. So the question then is, are we moving down? I think we have to move down a tier now, though. Do you think, or is this like a case of Monty Williams is screwed with our perception? Well, this is Jaden Ivey we're talking about. Uh, at number 11. Unclear. At number 11. I, I just... This tier gets really crowded. I, uh... so, the, so the argument you would make for having Ivey below in this tier where we have him at the moment, which is below from Jabari Smith to Koulibaly, is that like... It ha- the argument has to be that the upside isn't there, which is a tough case to make because of his athleticism. I think probably you'd say like his defensive mistakes and like some of the times on offense where he just shows like horrible feel and like dumb turnovers and stuff like that. Like some of that is concerning. 
but he's a second year guard on a terrible team that has kind of gotten jerked around and looked really good in the second half last year and then just didn't really get a chance to reprise that starting this season. So I, I just, I don't know. I can't decide if he belongs in the tier above with all those you other guys or you not. Screw me up here is that I think the player at number 12, I absolutely have in the tier above. And so it bears maybe recalibration. Oh, of... you, so uh, that's interesting. I don't think, I don't know if I agree with that. Um, I, I'm more now that I, cause I didn't look at who was coming up next. I kind of feel better about having Ivy and the next player in this tier with each other and not in the tier above. So we'll we do just, it. Because bear in mind, Jordan. like we're running out of tiers here. So like you, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember how many tiers we did initially. Uh, yeah, we're like slightly over halfway through. Um, okay, how about this? I think maybe we go Ivy and the next player, which is Keontae George, in the tier above because we. I think we probably got to start a new tier with number thirteen. Yeah. So uh, Keontae George is our number number. Th- uh, he's number twelve. Which, by the way, I, I could make a case that I might have him above Ivy because I kind of see the idea of him defensively more, and I trust that his off-the-dribble jumper might come along and be like this super-efficient weapon over Ivy. But again, we had them 11 and 12, and they're in the same tier now, but food for thought. Can I can I just ruin this whole thing and say I kind of want to put 13 in that same tier now, too? <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm this. We, maybe we're sipping the sauce, but this is... Honestly, no, that that's like a good idea because there's a chance that we just haven't seen enough of him yet. That's it. like even, but like some of the stuff I have seen from, and the guy we're talking about it. So he's at number, he's our 13, right? Yep. Is, is Amen Thompson. So we're going to keep him in this tier. He's at number 13 behind George and Ivy. He could very easily, I wouldn't put him above Bilal yet based off it, based off what we've seen. Yeah. But like he came in and if, again, if this is a list we would have done entering the season, is he like in the scoot? He's in the scoot Shangun yeah. here, right? I think he is. Um, I just like can't build as like slight more offensively advanced, similar shooting questions. <laughs> Funnily enough, uh, he's shooting 14% from three, <laughs> whereas so he's he's crushing his brother who's at 13%. Uh, but just like hasn't played, he played 20 games, hasn't had big minutes. I think. The, the theory of Amen Thompson is that he's like, I think the theory of Asar Thompson is he's like a playmaking wing, uh, uh, you know, hot, you know, fully realized, but Amen Thompson, I think might be viewed more correctly as like a, like a, a point guard, maybe sort of kind of like you'd see that in the way he plays and that he's had a little bit more trouble being a connective tissue player. Whereas Asar Thompson very much is more useful off the ball already i've been impressed with a lot of what amen thompson's been able to do defensively like he's just very sturdy and everywhere i mean both both the thompsons are just like athletically are never overmatched like already so so do you think amen should be in front of keontae and or Jaden? uh i mean if it's so hard because we just haven't seen him play enough Uh, i i'd feel okay about that but even i don't really have strong feelings about reordering like really anyone from like Miller to to Amon, honestly. Um, it's because you're I, a serial I, hedger. <laughs> yeah, you just want everyone in their own tier. This is why I like tier range. so much. Because we don't have to argue over like is 13 better than 14 or, or 12 so or whatever. Right now, though, rest of their career, you're taking Ivy over Thompson, Amon Thompson. Yeah, I guess if you frame it that way, I'm probably not. I think I'd rather have the unknown quantity of Amon more so. He than gets I. bummed. I'm taking Bilal over Amon Thompson. I don't fucking care. <laughs> <laughs> Well, would you take, uh, well, you've already said you wouldn't take Bilal over Asar, or would you? Because I take Asar, I think. I'd take well, Bilal. That's a tough question. That's a tough I question. Wouldn't, I don't know that I'd take him over Brandon Miller. I, I don't think I would. I would take him over Asar, Asar Thompson, but I do recognize that that's like controversial shit or divisive shit. Yeah. All right. So I think this gets easier, though, because at 14, I think we probably got to start a new tier. I have a wild stat for our number 14 player. And I do think, I do think this probably does need to start a separate tier. Yeah. So you want to reveal 14? Is your guy? Oh, oh, you said, I'm sorry. Brandon, yeah, Brandon, Brandon Pajemski pods, AKA pods. Now connector. And we've said it a bunch in this podcast is a cliche, but he like actualizes the cliche. Like this is just his impact is wide ranging and balanced. And it just like 
embodies the archetype that demands you watch him in every single capacity, where it's on the ball, off the ball, defense, offense. This is someone who's smaller, but he can guard up. He's not long, but he can guard against length. And he just, he fills the box score, but it, without filling the box score somehow. And he just makes sense. This is a wild stat, though. Here's every player, Grant, to average at least 15 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists, and two steals per 100 possessions before they turn 21. LaMelo Ball, Nikola Jokic, Tracy McGrady, your guy, and now potentially, if he finishes out the season like this, Brandon Pajemski. That's fucking yes. absurd. I'm it's too bad none of those other guys. He's making me curse. He, so it's the rebounding for him is he he's one of the best rebounding guards in the NBA right now today. Like he just, he is the numbers back it up and you can't watch a Warriors game without him like flying in from nowhere and out it's some, somehow out jumping forwards and just getting rebound. Whether the long, he, he hunts down long rebounds. He goes and gets contested once close to the basket elite rebounder. How much does that matter for a guard? I don't know, but like it's a legit NBA skill and he has it. Um, 39.1% from three. I think if you have questions about him, one of them has to be like, I don't the, the mechanics of his shot. Like he's, unless his shot mechanics change, he's really going to struggle to be an off the dribble three point shooter, which and he, he has to play, you know, well, it doesn't have to, because sometimes the Warriors have kind of started him as a de facto small forward, but like he's six, three, or I think he, he's listed a little taller than that, but he play, you know, looks like a six, three guy. Um, he, if you can't listen at six, five on basketball reference, that's bonkers. Um, he's going to need to be able to sh create his own shot off the dribble more than he does now to like be more than, you know, a fringe starter, I think. Um, but he scores it efficiently. He takes tons of charges. I'm sure he leads the warriors in charges by plenty. Um, and he just like the, the best analysis I heard of him, I forget where, uh, was basically, he leaves the possession in a better place than he found it on Ooh, offense, which is it. like, yeah, that feel that sounds good. Doesn't it? That, that feels yeah. good in the years. So uh, not, not like superstar upside, not probably not all star upside, like starter upside, I think, and has started games this year. So I, li I like him as a, as a beginning of a new tier. Number 15, same tier, Derek lively. The second on Dallas, just, Oh, they have their center of the future. All of a sudden he's, yeah. he's good. Now they need him to protect the paint. Because without him, they allowed parades to the basket. And he just works on offense. Not because Luka Doncic is there, but because he hustles his butt off, knows how to get back. I still love, he just has this, he's so smart on defense, where he's after ending a possession with a board, or even on offense, after he's finishing a dunk, he gets off the rim quick and he's back on defense. He's just processing everything so quickly. Um, I never would have thought, going into this exercise, like, when they got Derek Lively in the draft that we'd be putting him in front of who is number 16, Jalen Duran. And I'm just like, I like Jalen Duran, but I'm just very confident that Derek Lively the second right now belongs in front of him. Yeah, I think that's right. Duran, uh, probably every, I feel like we're saying this about every piston, uh, is like, Oh, the athletic upside and all this stuff. Like he might have the higher ceiling, but like, Lively is just like Lively is going to be bare minimum an awesome role playing starting center for 10 years. You know, like that's just mark it down Duran, I don't know yet because we haven't seen it. So I, I feel good about Lively above him, but the tiering I think works having them together. It's sort of just the defensive presence that Lively already brings where Duran can still be. It's tantalizing, but also chaotic mm -hmm. is what I think kind of sways it for me. Okay. Yeah, I agree. All right. So I think the next guy who are at 17 already probably. Nope. nope. Did I skip one? No, he's staying in this tier is what I'm telling you. Oh, no, I was going to say, I think he probably should stay in this tier. Oh. And I was going to ask if you had any argument against it. <laughs> You're ready, ready to drop the gloves on that one, huh? Case and Wall is at number 17. I know he can be passive offensively, but when he's clicking, he reacts really fast. He catches the ball. If he's, if there's not just like an open window to shoot, he was already off and running. He probably needs to look to finish more or pop up a floater or something. He defers too often, but like he keeps the ball moving in that scenario because he's basically an off guard for Oklahoma City a lot of the time right now. He shoots well from the corners um, and just shoots well in general off the catch. And then just, you talk about guarding up and defending your ass off. That's Case and Wallace to a T. And I am, look, this is, I don't think this is controversial at this point. I know he's played well. 
you know, for the, the recent stretch, but like he's going to be better than Josh Giddy. He's just going to be better and contribute to winning more than Josh Giddy does. I'm convinced. Yeah. I, we're going to have to have a Giddy discussion at some point later. Uh, but I think, I think I agree with that. I certainly think like if, if it's, Oh shit, we got to think about Giddy's next contract. Just the fact that Case and Wallace is sitting right over there in the first year of his rookie like, deal. Let some like, other team think about that. Yeah, let's, like, let's make that <laughs> someone else's problem because we got a guy that, like, on balance is going to give you, especially if you're trying to win playoff games. Like, I think Case and Wallace just like makes more sense as as a fifth. I don't know if, if you're going to start him necessarily, but as a as a key piece. All right, we're on to number eighteen. I think you should talk about him because I'll just be irrational about it. Um, well, so. No. so you're the one that needs to talk about him. And let's start with does Jonathan Kamingo, we have him at number 18. Does he, yeah. does he belong in this tier or are we, it, you know, I'm going to say number 19 definitely would start a new tier. I'm asking, does Jonathan Kamingo belong in the case in Wallace Jalander and Derek Lively pods tier? I think he absolutely belongs in that tier. And like okay. you could, I'm not going <laughs> to, I, I don't want to make the case that you could move him up a tier. Um, but I might. What is the, <laughs> so what is so can't miss about Jonathan Kaminga for the folks at home? And also myself who still doesn't necessarily understand what is so can't miss. Well, I think that's the problem is I don't know if there is. I, so you would say if you had to pick everyone like comes what, to us for this, just in-depth nuance, decisive analysis. What's what's his carrying skill? Because like you look at, say, like Lively, uh, he's going to be a great defensive center. He's going to protect the paint like, you know, go go down. the list. I don't know, like Kaminga, he doesn't necessarily have one of those. Like so he theoretically and has at times shown the ability to be like an awesome on ball defender against literally one through oh, against anybody one through four. Like that's he's done that a little bit. His just raw athleticism is, you know, is top 1% in the league. He's got the ideal frame you want in your combo forward. He is awesome at drawing contact and finishing through it. But like for every one of those things, you have the, he commits one to two dumb fouls away from the basket every game. It's hard to believe he's going to be like a, he's got the individual shot creation, like handle to be that guy. It's also hard to see him being like, Oh, he's got really good value off the ball. Cause he can space like shooting 30% from three this year, 37% last year, but the volume is not really there has never been he's 68% from the line for his career. So he's like, I don't know if you price in like, Oh, he's going to be a great shooter. So it's really the athletic frame, the ability to just overpower guys at the basket. Some of his drives look like lightning quick, but it's all just like peppered in with stuff that you're like, I don't know, man, if this guy's ever going to get it. So I think he has to be in this tier. I understand why you wouldn't move up, but like, again, I will cop to just being irrational about Kaminga. Cause I kind of sometimes only see the good. Well, I mean, we, like we, we just went through mine with Bilal. Like, like well, yeah. when I take him over, so real, where would you in this tier, would you have him like leapfrogging all the way, like above pods? I think if you're talking ceiling, there's no question he should be first in this tier. Um, wow. But I just don't know how confident I am he's going to hit it. Uh, okay. So, like, I mean, it, real honestly, like, if you're talking ceiling, I think he could be in the next tier, like, very comfortably. Because um, all those guys have questions. Um, it's just like, you know, this is his third year. He's kind of been jerked around. I mean, he's conspicuously been jerked around and, like, not really given... Like he's in a situation that, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. Like, well, is it harder for him because the Warriors cater to the vets and they play a system that like nobody else really does that marginalizes guys that aren't Steph Curry and Clay Thompson and Draymond? Like, or, or is it like, well, it should be easy for him because no defense is ever focused on him because of the guys he plays with. Like, should he, you know, so I just, I just still don't know what kind of player he's going to be. I think in the best case scenario, He's like an overpowering combo forward that shoots eight free throws a game and is just good enough as a shooter to to like have some value off the ball. But like, I really don't know that he's going to reach that ceiling. And like, I don't know if anybody really the Warriors, I think, believe that he will. But like everybody thinks that about their own guys. So I'm going to call I'm going to call an audible here on number 19. I think Jalen Green has shown enough to take over the 19 spot. I'm, Would you I'm say good that? that. 
do you think that still needs to start another tier? Oh, well, hmm. I think he belongs in this tier. There's just like, if you want to talk about like what Jonathan Kaminga's best case outcome could be, Jalen Green has a marketable skill, which is create for himself and score a shit ton. And it's not always yeah. efficiently, but sometimes it is. We've seen for entire long stretches of the season during his first two years to close out, he's going to hit a bunch of these tough off the dribble looks. Now, how does he fit inside the larger context? Houston is finding out, look, he's finding his way now. We're also finding out that it's difficult to still have that highest end outcome though, with most of year or a good chunk of year three in the rear view. I think that's still on the level of, okay, this is someone who could still be a very impactful starter on a lot of good NBA teams with his best case. Now, could he also be damaging? There is that boomer bust aspect of him where I don't think you have that with Case and Wallace or Pods, but you have it with Kaminga, and we have Kaminga in this tier. Can I ask you a question? No. Why? What's the difference between Shaden Sharp and Jalen Green? Is that From Shaden a- Sharp has a defensive pulse already? You think? And he's he's also he's also bigger. He's also a year younger. But I don't do you. I kind of view them similarly. Like if if. If you if we were doing well, this is a hard. I mean, I think we look at Sharp and say, like statistically, you know, he, him and I don't know, him and Green are just kind of of, of a type to me. Um, but I agree, okay. Sharp's bigger, has more defensive potential because Jalen Green is like, like really shooting guard sized at best and is thin. So like defensively, I don't think Jalen Green's. I mean, he's got a a long way to go and just may never get there because of the physical tools and just how he kind of plays. So I think, I think that's fair. I just, it, they're really far apart, sharp and green. And I don't know if that's quite right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then it's like, are we too high on sharp or too low on green type deal? I just think that part of sharp's appeal though, is we've seen less of him and like, we saw so little of him for most of last season that it's like, yeah. well, he's still, warrants the developmental reps where Jalen green was given the keys basically from day one. And this is what it's become. And now when you've tried to scale him back, I think there's probably more value in now you're scaling sharp up from a lower baseline that it will end up helping him. And I just trust when you look at his physical tools, he's going to give you more defensive optionality. And I just feel like way more rim pressure, foul drawing potential as well. I think that's right. I I think too, like, I mean, Jalen Green has started 182 NBA games. So, like, Holy we, we, we kind of know more about him than almost anybody else we've talked about. Well, I think that's probably, we definitely know more about him than anyone else we've talked about. With me, I know everything like, there needs to know about Bilal. So, we're, <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got all you need. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think Green for sure needs to be in this tier. Um, and the, just the question is, like, could you move him? Cause I just feel you look at Pajemski leading this tier and it's kind of like, if you offer well, Pajemski, we're talking about the rest of their careers, and it's sort of like the boomer bust almost works against Jalen Green at this point because that's true. we're in. If you're not going to have them as your first or second best player, you almost prefer to have people who are just going to be scalable. Yes, you're right. You're right. Now you're talking. I want to call now. another audible here because I don't think he was an oversight when we first went through this exercise, and I still think it begins the start of a new tier. But two players that I think belong here, and one of them would have been, I think Josh Giddy's got to be like twenty. I, I think he's I'm easy again this year. He yeah. rebounds. He's big. He's a good passer. Yep. I'm good with, I'm good with Giddy. Giddy's needs to be in the next tier though. Right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It, it starts a new tier. Yeah. Uh, now I still have doubts and I think the playoffs this year are going to say a lot about what does he do when defenses ignore him? Are the Thunder even going to trust him in the right. highest stakes lineups that they have in the postseason? I think we've already seen that they're not going to just in the sense that, Jalen Williams has been the more important self-starter in those non SGA lineups for much of, if not all of this season. And I just, you know, Giddy is fine defensively. Some people have called him a sieve. I don't think he's on that level. The Thunder do a good job of insulating him. When you look at who's around him, especially this season, he is such a good passer. And just for someone, his size to be that good of a passer. And he's shooting what, like 37% from three this year on ultra wide open looks that can sometimes take a long time to get off. But this is someone also who I recognize that we could look back on this at the end of this season. Let's say start of next season and be like, oh, did he need right. to be in the Keontae George tier or something? Yeah, right. I no, I think I I think I agree with everything you said. It's just like 
w- one, again, we've seen kind of a lot of him. 169 starts. Um, he started every game he's played as a pro, which is wild because he was 19 as a rookie. Um, or that was his age 19 season. The, just like there's a scenario where he doesn't help the Thunder on either end. And it's just like we can't move him up for that reason. Right. Like it's just it's there's too many like demonstrated flaws and and like theorizing how he fits onto a good team in a playoff scenario is like that's again, that's not like a consideration we're necessarily making for all these guys. But it's just like I don't, he might the, be the, better off running. I mean, he's he's been impactful for what might be the best team in the West. For all we know, I think the Clippers and the Wolves want a word there for sure. But I if I just he, don't I don't trust it. If he were on a team where he was the primary ball handler, I think it would be like, unfortunately, I think that's probably the best role for him because of the shooting issues. That doesn't address the fact that he defensively has a bunch of problems um, or the fact that he still doesn't have value off the ball, really. So I'm, I think I mean, you're right that he needed to be here. Three, though. And so there is, and also when you look at the like, splits and this is i would argue is a vote against him more than anything like he his efficiency without sga on the court is horrid yeah i I think like people are gonna bump on this i mean we had him like out (laughs) entirely i think i will bet you people will be people will say like how and like look at the tier above him you're really gonna have giddy career averages of 14 7 and 5 below brandon pajemski like who's like what has he been in the league for two months like that's crazy but it's just it's a skill set thing it's the shooting and the defense and the like what do you do with this guy like it's just those questions are harder to answer with giddy than it is for a lot of these others yeah and the other player that i think belongs in this tier, and i've started to actually warm up on him more in recent weeks benedict matherin would be 21 okay just there's i know your neither of us are like benedict matherin diehards i don't know what he's going to be defensively i don't trust the passing but as a the decision maker as a the, the decision making as a score, I feel like is a little bit more refined. And I think he get to a point where maybe he's running consistently or driving some of these non or maybe one star, maybe no star units. Now that they have Siakam and Halliburton, not as a playmaker, but just as like this safety outlet score. And as a score whose efficiency or effectiveness impact is not tied to, oh, am I playing with Halliburton? Or am I not? So yeah, I think that I think that's a big bonus of his favor. He's another one, just like Giddy, that I could see moving up. It's just I'm gonna trust steadiness. And that's like what basically the the tier above this. There's a lot more aside from Kaminga and Green, which are kind of like our swings. Um, but I also like with him and Giddy, I don't know that I, you know, where I see a pathway of oh, I could see Kaminga and Green like jumping up to that next tier. Mm-hmm. I could see them moving up to the next tier that's in front of them, but not into the, you know, Bilal, Amen Thompson, Jay Nivey, Keontae George. Yeah, tier. I think that's right. I think the, the sticking point with Matherin for me is he, he just like, he screams six man and like six men are valuable. Like that's, but, but it feels like, you know, we're, oh, we want these guys to be superstars, you know, like that, that's what you're going for in these under 22 types. You want, you want the prospect upside. And I, you know, it probably is too early to write any of these guys off from being anything, but Matherin just feels like he's a bucket getter that can get to the line. And like we talked to Caitlin Cooper, like a lot of the questions before the season were like, is Matherin going to be able to hit some threes? 37% this year. So like that's up from 32% last year. So I think if he's going to be like a 15 points per game on decent efficiency guy who gets to the foul line, that's a high floor. It's just like, you're not, he he probably isn't going to, you know, he started the year in the first unit for the Pacers. He's hasn't been in it for a while. I don't think he's going to get back into it most likely. So like, that's almost like, you know, that sort of is telling me what type of player he is. Um, This circles back to Giddy, but I was looking it up wild stat. Giddy is shooting 39.4% from three with Jay Gilders Alexander on the floor. He's shooting about 15.4% from three with SGA <laughs> off the floor. <laughs> so you're saying SGA generates some decent looks by driving. I did say on the previous podcast that the Thunder have the highest three point shot quality, meaning the easiest three point attempts. Jay Gillis Alexander and Jay Dub are like basically the main reasons why. Right. Yeah. Cause all they do is just attack the paint and kick. Okay. Who's, I'm good with Mather in there. 
who's our final inclusion at number 22? I know who it is when we initially did this, but there's two options we have. So like, let's just roll through them. We have Dyson Daniels, Anthony Black. Um, like who, who, who are some of the other names that spring to mind for, for you for this? We have Jeremy Sowen, Peyton Watson, Jordan Hawkins, Moses Moody, Jaden Hardy, AJ uh, Griffin, who doesn't play for some reason. Your guy, Usman Jang. Um, yeah, I, I will say, you know who I would include on this list? We He just hasn't played enough this year. Taylor Hendricks. You would. Just like you would include He's like, Taylor I'm Hendricks. Like, I'm ready to put him in front of like Paolo Bencaro. <laughs> <laughs> I think of the, so we only have one spot, right? Yeah. To me, it has to be between the guys we initially had in the top 22, which is Anthony Black and uh, Dyson Daniels. I think I, think it, I would go Daniels. I think. What about you? Uh, I think I would probably go Daniels too. You can I'm just agree. Trying... No, I'm trying to decide if I. Are we too low on Sohan? Like just because that's of the, the way guy. that we experimented that's, him at the beginning of the year? That's the guy I'm not sure about because like. The, the you know talk about a guy that was like put in a position a difficult position like i don't know what to make of this season at all because all of his numbers are like wrecked by having to play point guard and now they use him as a center sometimes so it's like i feel like that's almost an argument for him that his team would even consider trying him at both of those spots uh like good passer good defender uh, somehow a shooting 37 and a half percent from three but he's at sub 52 true shooting for a second consecutive year. And that's not to say that, you know, Dyson Daniels is, you know, 65 true shooting or anything, but. All right. I think, I think I would vote for Sohan. He's still 20. So he's I'm going like, to defer to you. So hold I, on, think, I'll throw I think him up I want to do that. Cause I think although like Daniel Daniels is the, I think I like Daniels better than Anthony black, but. Um, Daniels just, there's the passing the passing feel and then like absolutely gobsmacking defense. Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, he's a straight up better. Is he the best defender? I'm trying to, th I'm just looking back at the, I mean, I, we already talked about Asar Thompson. So the answer is no, he's not the best defender on this. Let's do, let's go. Let's go. I'm going to go. Sohan. I'm pulling up Dyson Daniels numbers right now, just to make sure. I mean, he's sub yeah. 52 true shooting as well. So don't even worry about it. I think, yeah. I think Anthony black probably is too. Uh, He's Anthony Black is so young though, and he already navigate gate, he already navigates the floor so effectively on the defensive end. I just don't know what to make of him as, you know, do you want him to be your primary? Is he ever going to have enough of a of a jump shot? I mean, he's hitting fifty eight percent of his twos this year. He actually has a fifty seven true shooting, impressive, and a one point yeah. six steal rate, one point seven block rate as a as a point guard. His turnover percentage is through the roof though, and so like I trust, believe it or not, I trust Sohan and. Daniels is, is I really like split it. We split the baby here and the answer is Dyson Daniels is really what it should be. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think it's so in, uh, just cause I like the, the, the positional versatility and the, would you say that? So we'll put someone at 22, but would you say like Daniels and black are probably in the same tier? I don't know if any of the other names that are still here, Moses yes. Moody, Usman Jang, Peyton Watson, no, Peyton Watson I, might belong in this tier. I think as a serial hedger, I feel like I, I like Anthony Black and Daniels in there in that tier. And we just had to cut it off at 22 because 22 under 22. That's the gimmick of it. Uh, we went there's to 24. 24 they're, under they're like another. And I think so. We'll we'll get to 25 here and Peyton Watson. Rounds yeah. Out this year. Get no in order there. in this tier. Um, but with so and Dyson Daniels, Black and Peyton Watson. I like it. Good job by us. So. I'll run through your order very quickly. We've Wemba, Victor Wembanyama at number one in his own tier. Tier two is Chet Holmgren at number two. Paolo Bencaro at number three. Alperin Shengun at number four. Scoot Henderson at number five. In Entering tier three, Jabari Smith Jr. is six. Shaden Sharp is seven. Brandon Miller is eight. Asar Thompson is nine. Blau Koulibaly is way too low at 10. Amen Thompson at 11. Jaden Ivey at 12. Keontae George at 13. We are now entering tier four. Brandon Pajemski at 14. Derek Lively the second at 15. Jalen Duran at 16. Casey Wallace at 17. Jonathan Kaminga at 18. Jalen Green at 19. That just seems so low. Yeah. <laughs> uh, tier five, Josh Giddy at 20. Speaking of too low, Benedict Mather at 21. And we have Jeremy Sowen at 22. And then, however you shake it, uh, Dyson Daniels, Anthony Black, Peyton Watson. It's like your final to round it out in the top 25. That's 22 uh, 
B, C, and D, I think. It's so hence 22A. Um, there you go. So 22A and then followed by 22B, C, and D. Um, that's our top 25-ish players under the age of, of 22. Hopefully you enjoyed it, but it's time to move on. It's stat padding. Grant, as I fix the screen, do you want to give me some stuff that you have uh, for me, I'm assuming? Absolutely, Dan. I just have to pull up this uh, stat head page here just so I can make sure that I'm not going to give you questions that you cannot answer uh, or that do not I, have. Honestly, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dan, there since 2000, 2001, so we're just doing like this century, I guess we'll call it. Uh, there have been several games that involved a player scoring 50 points without making a three pointer. So I'm going to give you four players. You tell me who has scored 50 points without making a three in a game. Number one, Tim Duncan, Shaquille O'Neal, Kevin Garnett, Carl Malone. Shaquille O'Neal. It is Tim Duncan. I apologize. Yeah, so he the one didn't Shaq only hit one three for his career? Yeah, that's why I was pulling this this stat head thing up because that that bump made me think like that's that's ridiculous. That can't be right. Uh, he probably won't want to cut that one up because I don't know if that's accurate. Um, how about this one? Let's see, Dan, who has the most fifty point games without making a three since two thousand two thousand one? Uh, Giannis. Anthony Davis, Joel Embiid, or Allen Iverson? Oh, with... I'm just going to say, what were the options? Giannis, Joel Embiid. I'm going to say Anthony Davis. You're correct, but it's a trick question because Giannis has exactly as many as Anthony Davis, which is three. Uh, Joel Embiid has two. Allen Iverson has two. This is a fun right. one. 50-point game, Dan, with no free throws made right this has happened first of all uh tell me who of these players have done it jamal murray stephen curry damian lillard or ray allen Ooh, ray allen it is jamal murray who did not even attempt a free throw in his 50 point game how about that wow that's pure bucket getting that's you know what <laughs> Just, that's ethical basketball right Fuck you, steph <laughs> just getting buckets uh okay so this is bizarre so, and, I, and there's like a bunch of these so i had to filter it uh a certain way so this is since 2015-16 tell me who has the most 50 point games in which their team was outscored while they were on the floor so they got 50 in the game and had a negative plus minus for the game who's got the most of these players, Steph Curry, Jamal Crawford, James Harden, or Zach Levine. Zach Levine. It is James Harden. Ooh. Three times, three times since 2015, 16, he's gotten 50 and his team has been well, out. I guess that just speaks to how often he scored. That's 50. the thing. You got to think yeah. of like, who's got the most. Was, of these games. I should have got that one. All right. Same question. Uh, most 50 point games since 2015, 16, while their team got outscored with them on the floor, Brad Beal, Kevin Durant, Dame Lillard, or Anthony Davis. Damian Lillard. It is Brad Beal. He's got three of them. He played for the wizards. I should have known. That's he did. Bad. He did. Uh, let's see just some fun facts just because, uh, so Booker's sons, uh, got outscored by six with him on the floor in his 70 point game against Boston in 2017. That's hard to do. Outscored by how many? Uh, by six. Okay. So he had 70 points and his team got outscored by six while he's on the floor. Beals Wizards got outscored by nine in his 60 point game against the Sixers in 2021. How about this? Steph Curry has two. There have been four instances in which a player had 50 points in a game and his plus minus was minus 10 or worse which is like, how does that even happen? Steph has two of them. Uh, he's got a minus 14 against Phoenix, which is the worst of anybody, and a minus 11, that was uh, in 22-23, and minus 11 against the Clippers, also in 22-23, when he had over 50. Dub should trade him. Get rid of him. He's the problem. That's been the case all along. Uh, do you have any for me? I have some uh, some retired jersey uh, 
can't how many I have a bunch. Do you just want to wrap up yours and we'll go sure in- all right let me pull this up here i wasn't sure how to format this i think i want to give you a team and three strikes and then see if you can name five players with retired jerseys for that team okay i'll start easy with for you you get i don't think anybody i don't know how this team has any numbers left uh that are unretired uh dan I'll give you three strikes. Can you name five Boston Celtics with retired jerseys? Larry Bird. That's one. Paul Pierce. Did they retire his jersey? Let me find him. That's two. Uh, Bill Russell. That is three. Oh, my God. Why is this so hard? Uh, Kevin Garnett. Uh, That is four. Robert Parrish. Oh, I don't know if that's going to get it for you. Yes, that's five. Good job. No strikes necessary. Um, I'm going to get, okay, you got to do a harder one. Let's see. Uh, that, that's unfair. I was going to give you one that you would have had to get a coach. <laughs> All right. How about, let's do this. Dan, can you name, I'm going to give you three strikes, but you only need to name three golden state warriors with retired jerseys. Okay. Will Chamberlain. Correct. Chris Mullen. Correct. I feel like this should be easy, but I can't blanking after those two. This guy was the reason they won the 1975 championship, which was the only championship they had until the most recent ones. Uh, or the most recent championship that, that does not help me, even though it probably should. Uh, had s- multiple sons play in the NBA. Allegedly wore a hairpiece during his career. I can't even like come up with a wrong guess. <laughs> Shot free throws, granny style. Oh, oh my god. What? <laughs> <laughs> as a like probably from middle school through college uh one of his sons was one of my favorite players you got three strikes oh okay, you this is the issue you can't come you don't have a wrong I like, i'm trying to think of legendary warriors and just like i can't come can't come up with i was gonna say don nelson but that's clearly wrong <laughs> i'm trying to think of more hints i could give you uh let's see White guy, Bob <laughs> Cousy, <laughs> no wrong franchise. Why? Why can't I think of any? I'm like on the spot. I can't think of any other legendary warriors. It's so right hard now. when you're on the spot like this. I'm sitting here thinking, like, come on, Dan. But it's like it's not this. I'm looking at the name, so it's a little different for me. How many jerseys have they retired? Not a lot. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, I feel like I should know that. I give up. Uncle. Rick Barry. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Who else have they retired? Uh, Thomas Sherry, Al Adels, and Nate Thurmond. Nate that doesn't Thurmond make me feel too bad because I only should have known Rick Barry. I never would have guessed the other three. All right, I'll give you one more. And this one, I think you should get... I think you should get... I'll give you... You got to get three. I'm going to give you three strikes. Houston Rockets. Name me three retired jerseys for Houston Rockets. Hakeem Olajuwon. Yep. Yao Ming. Yep. Claude Drexler. Yep. I was surprised. I'm kind of surprised they retired Yao's jersey. That feels weird. He was there for like five minutes. He was a franchise icon, and like there's an entire continent that follows the Rockets (laughs) now because he played there. Like the reason China cares about basketball. Okay. You got to get five. I'm going to give you three strikes. Los Angeles Lakers retired jerseys. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah. Magic Johnson. Yeah. Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Kobe Bryant again. No, I'm just, I won't let that go. Shaq. Oh, I mean, technically. It's Kobe Bryant twice, but that'll count. I'm going to count as one. Shaq. Yeah. And they retired Wilts. Oh, wait, did they? Let's see. Did they retire Shaq's? They did retire Shaq's jersey. Yeah, they did retire Wilts jersey. You want to go for a bonus? Can you name any others? Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I should be able to. Uh, 
why am I going to, I don't want to say his name. Only I'm guy to win finals MVP while losing the finals. Ooh, I should know the answer to this one. There's so many iconic Lakers. How am I not yeah. just spitting these out? And they retired like 90 jerseys. There's too. a lot. I think the Celtics are the only one with more just based on the sheer length of this list. Uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, if I gave you one more clue about the guy who lost the finals and won MVP, you would get it. Uh, he's the logo. Oh, Jerry West. Yeah, I should have got that one. The other one is like, I mean, most famous for playing for the Minneapolis Lakers uh, in like the 50s. Wore glasses. There's a famous layup drill named after him. None of this is helping you. <laughs> no. George Mikan. Uh, George Mikan. All right. I think that's enough torture for you. Um. All right. Uh, are you ready to be tortured? Uh, always. Got some money questions for you, Grant. Ooh. Which NBA player has made more money for their career so far? Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Chris Paul, or Russell Westbrook? I'm going to say Chris Paul, just because he's been around forever. That is incorrect. He is the second most on this list. Kevin Durant at $396.7 million <laughs> comes in first place. Steph is in third at about 355. Russell Westbrook at 343 is fourth. That four for 44 deal that Steph signed that won him all yeah. those championships. That really hurts him. Well, not in last place though. Good for him. Yeah. Which NBA player has made more money for their career so far? Paul George, Kyrie Irving, Kawhi Leonard, or Damian Lillard? Ooh, Dame's got that big contract right now. I'm going to say, I'm going to say Dame. That is incorrect. He is, he is second though. So you got second place again. Paul George at 305.3 million. Wow. I would not so have guessed. Damon 279, Kawhi at about 277, Kyrie at 270. Okay. Which NBA player has made more money for their career so far? Giannis Atentacumpo, Bradley Beal, Jimmy Butler, or Clay Thompson? <laughs> I think I got to go with. I'm going to go Bradley Beal. That is correct. He who signed the full-on Supermax first before any of these guys. Actually, he's the only one who signed the full-on Supermax. So yeah. he hasn't even played out most of it. Yeah, but Clay 267.9 million first place. Okay, Clay had a couple Submax deals in like he's second, Butler. 266. Butler's 263 in third. Giannis, he'll finish in first, I'm sure, yeah. eventually. But yeah. 234.5. He's probably the only guy in that group that's getting another max deal, I think, for like the full boat. Okay, good question. Now. Block of 10 with the same question of either or. So it's which NBA player has made more money for their career so far? DeMar DeRozan or Tobias Harris? I'll say Tobias Harris. It is DeMar DeRozan, 257.6 to 248.5 million. Joel Embiid or Rudy Gobert? Oh, it's Rudy. Correct. 217.2 million to 214.4. I like how I was so confident it was three million apart. <laughs> Nikola Jokic or Brooke Lopez? Brooke Lopez. No, Nikola Jokic, 198.1 million to 197.1. Those years at the biannual for Brooke and Oh, that hurt him. Did, that hurt him, yeah. Danilo Gallinari or Kristaps Porzingis? Hmm. Gallo's been around so much longer. I'll say Gallinari. Correct, and it's not even close. 201.7 million for Gallo to 175.1 for Kristaps. Man, Gallo has made over 200 million dollars for his NBA career. Good for him. And he's had at least one torn ACL, right? Or, he's maybe, had two, at least two torn ACLs. Okay. It might even be three at this point. So he's lost a bunch of years. I guess Porzingis has lost zero all star appearances. A very good player, zero all star appearances, made over 200 million dollars for his mm -hmm. career. Put put a pin in this. We got to figure out who's made the most money in his career without an all star appearance. It's probably Ooh, okay. Mike Conley, but yeah, well, Mike Conley made an all star. Did, did he get the honor right now? Course? I forgot he did finally make. I, it. I mean, it's Gallo, right? <laughs> <laughs> if it's not, congratulations to somebody else. Carl Anthony Towns or Andrew Wiggins? Oh, I think it's Wiggins. He's just been around longer. It's correct. Not that close either. One ninety five point two million to one eighty two point three million. Yeah. Devin Booker or Derek Rose? Oh, I 
I'm going to, I'm going to say Booker. That is correct. 166.5 million to 166.1 million. I'm getting my decimals now. Come on. I mixed in a bunch of like, there's like large differentials, okay. some obvious ones. Like you probably thought I was trying to trick you with Tobias Harris versus DeMar. But I, I, I did. You And you did. <laughs> Blake Griffin or Chris Middleton? Hmm. I'll say Blake. That is correct. 257.6 million to 223.1 million. God, that's, that's surprisingly close too. Anthony Davis or Gordon Hayward? It's gotta be Anthony Davis. It is not Anthony Davis. Gordon Hayward, 268.4 million. Anthony Davis, 266.6 million. Unbelievable. Good for Gordon Hayward. Brandon Ingram or Pascal Siakam? Or we're not counting the super, the, the max that he's going to sign with the Pacers, probably. So uh, far was the question. So, <laughs> I'm going to say Ingram then. That is correct. 145.6 million to 143.2 million. Mm. Boyan Bogdanovich or Jason Tatum? Jason Tatum. That is incorrect. Jason Tatum has made 120.6 million. Boyan Bogdanovich has made 123.6 million. <laughs> okay, I don't feel too He's bad made a good him. living. He's done well. Okay, uh couple so just three more that are just a, you know, this was inspired by when Wemby got his triple double. Okay. Which NBA player has recorded the most triple doubles before their 21st birthday in NBA history? LaMelo Ball, Luka Doncic, LeBron James, or Magic Johnson? I'll say Luka. That is correct. 21. The next closest is Magic at 12. LaMelo has six. LeBron has five. Who is the youngest NBA player on record to notch a triple double? LaMelo Ball, Luka Doncic, Josh Giddy, LeBron James, or Victor Wembanyama? Five choices. I, I, Giddy was the first name that came to mind, so I'll say Giddy. That is correct. 19 years old and 84 days. Unbelievable. Who is the oldest NBA player on record to record a triple-double? Five choices. Tim Duncan, LeBron James, Jason Kidd, Carl Malone, John Stockton. I'm going to say LeBron. That is incorrect. He is the third oldest at 38 years old, 350, 38 years, 353 days old. Carl Malone, first place, 40 years and 127 days. You should have known that's the answer because I would never have scumbag human beings on purpose as part of trivia. So that's I, would why never I didn't pick him. Oh man, he must have been uh, a Lakers triple double, right? Or was he? I I, I don't know what put you on the spot for that, but if he was forty, it had to be right. He wasn't I, in Utah for his. He was in that lone season. I'll double check to make sure that he wasn't in Utah when he was forty. But I would have thought. Uh, no, yeah, he was age forty. Season was with the Lakers. So when did when's his birthday though? His birthday's in July. So yeah, he turned forty in July and then played out that season. So yes, it was with the Lakers. Jeez, okay. That's all I got for you. Do you want to take us out of here? That's it. Sure. Th good, good question. I like the money ones. Uh, everybody, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for watching. If you watched, uh, look, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you, you subscribe, make sure you're, uh, you know, get in there and comment as Dan likes to say, help the algorithm love us back. Uh, follow us on all our socials. They are posted on the screen here at hardwood Knox on Twitter and TikTok. I'm still calling it Twitter. I'm never going to not do that. I don't you think can't, what are, like, you can't call it X. We're not talking about like porn. <laughs> like an, it sounds like an OnlyFans site. Or like, and what? What are, you, are we Xing when we like post? What is it called? You're, you're just posting. You're just just making a post. Uh, if uh, if you want to get involved, if you want to give us guess of players, or you can contribute to stat padding too. If you've got ideas, Lord knows it's hard to keep coming up with these. Uh, get on Discord. Uh, the link to figure out how to do that is in the YouTube and podcast description, as is the link uh, to check out our merch. Um, what else? Uh, wherever you're listening to this rate review give five stars subscribe that's that's spotify that's apple that's uh whatever your podcast uh service of choice is uh that helps us out and we uh just want to keep growing our listener base and our subscribers and everybody that uh we appreciate so much so uh yeah join the club it's fun you can 
very directly contribute. Uh, get your questions and your guest of players on here. Uh, I think that's going to do it for us. As always, we close with a shout out to the one and only Frank Nilakina and an apology to Jared Allen.